Mm-hmm. Goalkeepers, players, parents, Christian from KeeperStop.com. This is the KeeperStop.com goalkeeper show, but we have a great topic that encompasses everything re- related to recruiting. So whether you're a, a goalkeeper, a player, or a parent, a friend of a goalkeeper, or a friend of a player, we have a very mm-hmm. special guest, somebody close to my heart. Today's topic is rules, regulations. Players, parents, oh, Christian there's some, Keeper there's some, uh, there's some feedback there. Huh? This is the KeeperStop.com. So we can hear it. Oh, all right, you're gonna go. <laughs> all right, just kidding. Let's start again. Today's rules, regulations, and considerations for Division One college soccer recruiting. Today's special guest is Beth Wandes. It's she's a senior associate athletic director at Bryant. Um, today, what we're going to really learn about is going to learn the basic rules for the 2020 Division I soccer recruiting um, season. And this is with, again, the Bryant University Senior Associate Athletic Director, Beth. All right. You know, you'll, if you ever email her or you're in trouble, it'll say Bethany. But Beth is a friend of ours, uh, former student athlete. We're going to learn a little bit more about Beth. Uh, Beth not only keeps her coaches and athletes compliant with NCA regulations, but also is a mom of an aspiring Division I athlete. She's a former college basketball coach, as well as a former student athlete when we played at Bryant together. She played basketball, I played soccer. Um, And her family is currently involved in this recruiting process. So I think she's an amazing resource for players and parents alike. Beth, say hello. Hello, good to see you, Chris. I'll give you a, a pass because you said my last name wrong. Uh, I, Wandice, but you knew me as Keneally, so we'll, we'll, we'll be okay with that. Yeah, I, you know, the Bryant, uh, you know, education wasn't as good as it is now. So <laughs> my, my phonics skills, you know, I was a marketing major and an English minor. I should have gotten it. But yes, yeah, so <laughs> Beth, I knew the artist formerly known as um, Beth, but prior to being married, and so I always go back to that 
you know, who do you, who do you know? And I remember you as a, you know, 18 to 22 year old, unbelievable basketball player. But uh, Beth, tell us about yourself just so we can get some context of who you are and, you know, what your expertise is. We all have to go pro in something. So maybe are some of our athletes on, could you go pro in this? So if you meet her in the grocery store, she's one of the people that have the hands on the purse string. So make friends. All right. I'm, ju I'm just I'm just kidding. Uh, Beth is by the book. She's an amazing professional and I'm looking forward to learning a lot. So here's my disclaimer, though. Uh, we are on a YouTube live event and this is in May 2020. This interview is being conducted May 15, 2020. The NCAA rules change every year. My suggestion, and I'm sure Beth's suggestion is going to be, is always visit the NCAA.org website for the most up-to-date recruiting rules and information. Beth is merely providing guidance and opinion as she interprets the rules today, May 15, 2020, as a senior associate athletic director and a parent of an aspiring Division I athlete. So this is conversation. This is to help guide and kind of put things in perspective. But, you know, like doing your taxes, Always refer to the IRS. Don't refer to TurboTax. You know, Beth is far better than TurboTax is. Not that they're an endorsee of this program by any means. But uh, so always refer to NCA for any, any, any recruiting information. So let's get started. You ready? Especially now. I mean, the rules are changing daily in, you know, with COVID-19. Um, so what the rules are today, they probably are not going to be the same rules next year. Hopefully we're in a much different space. Um, so, you know, this is pertinent just as of today. All right. So based, uh, based on that, what I want to go over is just to start, if, if anybody takes anything away from this, there's so much information that's available regarding Division I recruiting, and the information for one, two, and three all differ. So again, this is Division I recruiting. Um, the rules change every year. What is the best resource for athletes and families to understand the rules? Yeah, like you said, you always reference NCA.org, um, the NCA Eligibility Center as well, depending on uh, what year you are in, because a Division I prospective student athlete will have to register with them. Um, also, and I'm not endorsing any recruiting services um, when I say this, but I do reference the um, NCSASports.org website uh, frequently. They just lay it out really cleanly and um, easy to read. NCA is not always puts things out in layman's terms. Um, so again, can't trust that everything is quite up to date on that website. It typically is, um, but that is a good website to reference for the rules and to get calendars and things like that. I would have to agree. The NCSA has a ton of information. Obviously, they're trying to have you sign up for the recruiting services. And again, I understand you're not endorsing any of that, but like anything, they're great abstracts to read if you want further clarifications. Um, as a former Division One coach for over a decade, um, Division Two and Division Three before that, I mean the NCA book is thick, you know. So it is sometimes like reading a law journal or uh, a tax publication. But again, it's what it's for is to make sure that there's no no wiggle room. So that's great. Make sure you take a picture of that. You write down those references. So um, you know if you guys have any questions. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you can ask them um, afterwards. I'll be happy to answer any if I can. Um, uh, but we understand this is a difficult process, but these are some of the things that we do suggest. So currently, what are the key years and dates 
for Division I recruiting, such as when to contact coaches, uh, go on visits, register for the NCA Eligibility Center, which is always a big one when I was involved. Yep, so um, right now the NCA just extended our dead period um, due to COVID-19. So um, things have changed. So the typical dates are, um, you know, not holding as true. Uh, we're in a dead period until June 30th, 2020, which means that you're not permitted to um, on-campus recruit or off-campus recruit. So student athletes can't come on campus for an unofficial or official visit and our coaches can't go out um, and see them play either. So, um, you know, a little, little different this year. But for 2020s and 2021s, um, you know, what's going on right now is the same thing that's been going on for them. Programs are still recruiting. Classes are not made at every single college. Um, you can phone call, text, Zoom, email coaches anytime. When visits become permissible, you are able to do that at this time. And, you know, send film and reach out and ask questions. I mean, these are juniors and seniors uh, we're talking about. And if you're in contact with coaches, then ask them questions. Where are you in their process? What does their process look like? What are their timelines? Some coaches may want to wait and see kids again, or they may not want to, or their class may be full. So it's, you know, good questions to ask. Also a good time for those classes that if you're not getting interest, that you felt you maybe should have is maybe look at other options, look at other levels. There's many levels of division one. Um, there's also different divisions, as Chris said, division one, two, and three, and it's all good soccer um, at each level. So um, that would be my advice to those classes. Um, for the 2021s, a um, little stressful, I'm sorry, 2022s, stressful right now as june 15th approaches that is the big day for um, current sophomores um, that is the day that phone calls and emails can begin happening so it's supposed to be the start of the recruiting process um, for the 2022s um, as of right now as of I as far as i know that is can still happen on june 15th in this dead period the nca is still permitting phone calls to those that it's permissible to um, so that's the big day um, for them. And then in a perfect world, official visits and unofficial visits can happen August 1st. So again, that will all be dependent on um, the opening of states. And as long as the NSA doesn't um, continue to extend that, that dead period, which um, we've heard it may go through the end of July, they may extend to then, but we haven't heard um, through August. On June 15th, things to expect for the 2022s is the phone calls to include virtual texts. They can private message you on social media because that is like an email, um, email as well. You can receive verbal um, offers of athletic aid, um, not permitted to sign anything um, financially at this time until you're a senior. Um, so that, you know, is kind of what to expect on um june june 15th i love the i love the graphics on here you're you are you are a uh, an amazing professional so you know i was well, ready i just this for other other people too <laughs> i was just ready to have like a conversation cup of coffee you know us uh, you know catch up in old times now what do i do i have to act professional during this thing i know listen i'm presenting on to people all the time so wardrobe can you get me a, can you get me a tie a tie here i need a tie <laughs> anybody have a tie? i need a button down something with a collar um no all great have changed the 90s, huh? <laughs> all all great i was just like uh it made me think about uh the cell phone obviously because that's you know having you know the ability to contact people on cell phones i mean we barely had emails and i remember we had one mutual friend named caesar that had a cell phone but he was the only one on campus <laughs> in his range rover he had a cell phone i felt like i was a boss just being yeah. next to this thing and it was like this yeah. big but hello yeah. um but no those are all great dates uh to reference so i suggest taking pictures of them um you know some great information on there just to help clear up uh confusions i wanted to talk about certain um uh, you know names uh and i because i know they get thrown around interchangeably i think coaches sometimes forget about what they are but what i wanted to talk about is the confusion between contacts and evaluations what is the difference and when are they permissible you covered a little bit about that but what's the difference between contacts and evaluations 
Yep. So a contact is anything face to face. It's kind of like a touch point. So you are talking with someone um, in person. Um, an evaluation is more what you'll see most of the time um, is a coach sitting watching you play. Um, you also can have academic evaluations where coaches can go to schools. That's more um, a football thing, to be honest with you. Um, but that is the main difference. And there's rules on how many contacts and evaluations coaches um, can have with each prospective student athlete. But yeah, a, a contact is um, a home visit or um, talking in person, um, something other than just a greeting. So the, the rules are, you know, you can say hi to a coach and just walk by. You can't have really more conversation than that in person or it becomes um, a contact. Yeah. Um, so a player can't speak to a coach at an evaluation other than saying hello to count to count as just an evaluation. If they go into a, a detailed conversation, then that changes, right? Right, I mean, hi coach, how you doing? I mean, they're gonna be human, we're all human, you know, can say, hey, great. And then um, that's really about all, you know, they, they can do at, you know, until you've um, signed. You know, back, back when I was doing it, Amy, if you're watching, sorry, but I'd be like, I just would sit down and be like, oh, so, I'm I'm sitting next to somebody. I have to engage in a conversation. Oh, yeah. It was just it was convenient. just it was just yeah, normal. Very convenient. <laughs> it yeah. was very convenient, but I was just being polite. I'm rep representing a university. I have to be cordial. So, but right. I so, mean, it's hard. You're all crammed around this field. There yeah. are supposed to be certain spots that the coaches sit, and the parents are in other areas. But um, you yeah. know, we were at ECNL showcases in December and January, and that was not the case of what was happening. So, I mean, everyone can be human and, you know, talk. Just don't talk about your recruitment. <laughs> they know they know who you are. So, and you and you're like, um, all right, go sit over there. You know, just I'm just kidding. Yeah. I mean, it's it's got to be difficult for you because you wear multiple hats. Obviously, as a professional senior associate athletic director, and as a as a parent going through this process. So it does have to be. Uh, difficult. Yeah, the hat does come off. I mean, I'm there to watch my daughters, and um, I'm not there to, oh, to of course. regulate I know, I know. anyone. <laughs> yeah. I, I know. So, um, you know, I did ask some of my players that I coached throughout the years, like, what questions would they have? And the question that came up a lot was just on scholarships. And every athlete feels that because they played for a top ECNL or DA Academy, or they've been, you know, told for 10 years after they paid five grand every season that they're going to be a, you know, a college scholarship athlete. You and I both know that is a misconception, a unicorn, a fallacy. Can you help um, demystify division one soccer scholarships? Some of the misconceptions that every great athlete comes, uh, comes to at some point in time. And again, they all come from great clubs. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, at college, there are kids on um, big scholarships. There are some on little, some are none. And it doesn't determine your role or the value um, to the team. In um, women's soccer, Division One can only give 14 scholarships. In men's soccer, they can only give 9.9. .9. So, you know, do the simple math. The rosters in college are around 28 or so is the average Division One. Um, so if you do the math, every person on that roster is not getting a full ride. So you'll see more of combinations of aid, be it academic scholarships, need-based. Every college also awards financially differently. Um, so you'll see some packages, some stacking of aid, if that's permissible at that college. Um, also, what are the college's needs for your class? Do they need your position? Um, what do they even have available in that recruiting class? Some years, They'll have a lot of money graduating. Some years they won't. They'll have an injury that year. A kid may come back for a fifth year and um, use athletic scholarship dollars. So you just you just never know. Um, but I try to say it like it's simple math. If you can only have 14 or nine, it, it doesn't spread out to everyone getting a, a full scholarship. Unfortunately, that's the bill of goods that many players or parents are sold just so that they can continue playing with the club. There's a lot of great coaches, a lot of great clubs out there. But again, just as Beth has said, the money is uh, limited. Um, I wanted yeah, to get... And, um, I just wanted to say this, Chris, this is also a misconception with social media nowadays, is that we always see 
all these people signing. Yeah. Like you don't even know what they're signing. They could be <laughs> signing um, a commitment to a tent. Um, and that just permits us to, or a financial aid agreement, that just permits us to release them to the media. Or they could be signing an NLI, but an NLI could be $1 or $50,000. So I think people see signing and they just assume they're going there for, for nothing, which is not the case. Yeah, I mean, I my my national letter of intent, my signing at Bryant, there wasn't uh, there wasn't any media uh, coverage on that one. So no. <laughs> nobody cared. <laughs> what year was that? 1993. That would have been. I I yeah. look very I I you know I have a little bit of grays, but in the right light, I look still look very young. So thank well, you. Well, I laugh because um my coach um drove it to my house, which is a violation that now I know that's a violation. Um, maybe it wasn't in the early nineties. I, I don't know, but um, I joke about that all the time. Like you couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> there was, there was no email. So she wanted yeah, to get it, right? wanted to get yeah. it quick before somebody else got you. You're yeah. a, you were a, a hot prospect at the time. So yeah, well, <laughs> really. <laughs> all right. So um, something else I want to start covering because you know, and we're, we're, we're having fun here. We're keeping conversation light, and I think it's very important. But I think it's also important to really talk about we are in an unprecedented time in our history, which is impacting everything, including Division I uh, college recruiting, soccer recruiting. I have to be specific soccer again because football rules, basketball rules, soccer rules can differ. Um, how is the NCA modifying academic standards to reflect distance learning? changes in the grading system i know some schools are going past fail right now because it's just they're not sure what to do and the inability to take the sats and acts yeah i mean you know the ncaa has for um the class of 2020 only has given relief that you do not need to present an sat or act score um, they have they're calling it the covid 19 waiver so if you meet um, the 10-7, uh, which is in your first seven semesters, you have 10 core courses and you have a 2.3, um, you will be an automatic qualifier by the NCA. If you do not meet that, then you have to go through the regular process and um, meet that, but they are giving relief on that. We only have guidance on the class of 2020 so far from the NCA, but they are evaluating what the um, long-term impact will be um, on you know, eligibility for a high school um, student athletes, they know the juniors have had the SAT and ACT canceled several times already. There'll be less opportunity to take it. It'll be more stressful um, thinking that, you, you know, you're going to have to do it your senior year and what that means. Um, so they are evaluating um, all of that. The colleges have already pivoted as well um, with some going test optional that have not been test optional in the past. Um, or revamping test optional um, and what you have to submit. They're also accepting right now unofficial transcripts a lot of times and you know needing official ones later. The NCA as well is, is receiving unofficial transcripts for the first time. So um, I think everyone understands and they understand it's going to be more than just a class of 2020 um, impact. Um, and I think we'll see some you know some new legislation or changes as as we go along, but. Um, everyone seems to be understanding of it and um, the colleges too are worried about en enrollment and stuff as well so um, they're going to do whatever it takes to, to make their classes. Yeah, private universities it's still a business <laughs> obviously they want to provide a a product you know a service education is obviously the primary focus but at the end of the day they want to make sure they can pay their bills and keep their dorms open also. Um, I want to highlight some of the things you're talking about, the 10-7, those core classes. So this is why it's exceptionally important, and we'll, we'll reinforce this throughout the entire conversation, is that you need to prepare. You're not just an athlete, right? You're going to high school, whether it be public or private. You're going to school for an education. You know, one of your luxuries as being a, a student is to be an athlete. So it's very important that you prepare for college, for after high school, in your freshman year, hit those core courses. Don't scramble your junior and senior year. Like I've seen so many athletes, great athletes that would have been 
you know, difference maker on the soccer field, but they weren't Division One qualifiers because they were missing a math, missing an English, missing a language, you know, you know, didn't didn't prepare for their SATs, you know, what have you. Prior preparation prevents poor performance and problems with the NCA. So Yes, I agree. And, um, you know, the NCA Eligibility Center is a great resource to see your high school guidance counselors as well. You should let your guidance counselors know um, that you, you know, are looking to play Division One or Division Two because Division Two, you have to be a qualifier as well. There's different standards, but they're um, pretty similar. Um, so you want to meet your high school and state graduation requirements, but you also need to meet the NCA requirements, which can be different. Um, so, you know, just make sure you're working with guidance. Register for the eligibility center, um, juniors and seniors, that should already be done. Um, the rising, you know, the so current sophomores, 2022s, should register probably, you know, now or definitely before August 1st, coaches will start asking for those ID numbers because to take a visit official, you have to be registered with the NCAA eligibility center. Um, and then, you know, once you're a junior, you want to have your high school submit transcripts. They do early reads now, um, so you know exactly uh, where you stand. But there is a cost. It's $90 for domestic students, $150 for international. Um, so you do have to pay that fee in order for the coaches to activate your account on their end. I, I mean, I was reading recently, though, there are still waivers for that if you are a financial, if you're of, of financial need. Yes, if you... Um, and I'm losing the terminology right now, but if you qualify for free lunch, um, then there is a waiver and your high school guidance counselor will um, can submit that on your behalf to the NCA. That's great. I mean, again, the NCA also wants you to be on the field legally by their standards, but also meet your you know, financial contribution levels as well. So everybody's working for the same reason, which is to you know maintain their eligibility, get you an education, the NCA just tends to be, they're the, they're the end all, they're the Supreme Court. So they just wanna make sure everything's by the book, but still a great resource. So um, great references. I appreciate those dates and times. Um, you covered a little bit about it, but I just wanted to go over it a little bit again. Spring 2020 is a lost recruiting time frame for athletes and coaches. No soccer being played, no tournaments. Keeping the NCA rules in mind, you know, how are coaches identifying a recruiting potential student athletes yeah well you know i've had a lot of conversations with people about this i think the first thing is is that listen we're all in the same position everyone's in the same position the um students have lost the season the college students have lost the season the coaches have lost the recruiting season and they've also lost the spring with their teams um as well to, to prepare them so um you know really what you can do now is continue to keep in touch with the college coaches. Obviously there's less updates to give because we're all basically home right now. Um, but just keep in touch every now and then. If you have film, you could send film um, to them. You could ask your coaches um, to reach out um, to the, you know, the schools that you're interested in. And um, you know, that's really all you, you can do right now. But I know a lot of people are stressing out, but you know, everyone's in the same position. So if there's not, no one has a leg up. I keep hearing, they're gonna be behind, they're gonna be behind. I'm like, behind what? Everyone's in the same spot. Like who's behind right now? We're all in the, we're all in the same holding pattern. Um, yes. Some of the coaches' conversations that I've had are, you know, they're being creative as far as the films that they watch. So, you know, and this is again, me, this is not Beth's, uh, you know, advice. You know, you can counter it if you'd like. It's just that, you know, you can send your coaches full game you know, that were happening just this past fall. You know, full games are great. You can send them training videos. Any good coach is gonna be able to look at your technical prowess with a, with a training video. When we know what fluff is and what's not, we can still look at footwork handling, you know, distribution for goalkeepers, you know, your touch if you're a field player, how you strike the ball. But again, that game film is great. So I would also, you know, start developing a log of, um, great game films one complete game where you played stellar but also it could be a clip of what you've been doing you know in different scenarios throughout the season oh, that's perfect i'll let you as the, the soccer coach respond to that <laughs> um 
So I appreciate your questions, but just based on NCA rules as well, I can't address names and questions directly with Beth because it would be a violation if she did uh, address um, those questions directly. So I have many of these questions that some of goalkeepers, field players alike, would I believe that they would be interested? So keep the questions coming. We'll try to answer them if we can, but Beth can't answer them directly. So it's not that um, we are ignoring them. It's just that we can't based on NCA rules. You got us again. Um, I, know. I think one thing, um, you know, we have a lot of time right now. Um, well, the kids do. I don't as compliance with the rules change in daily. But, um, you know, really thinking about the, the process and what your child wants or what you want is in your experience. And that's one thing I'm constantly like, it's their experience. It's the, you know, the prospective student athlete going um, to college and having the hopefully the experience they want. So it's a good time to research, um, to look at, you know, what part of the country do you want to go to? What school size, urban, suburban? Um, what are you potentially looking at academically? You know, I say things like, if you want to be a nurse, you should go somewhere that has a nursing program. We see kids do that all the time, um, where they'll go somewhere because they, they want to play for that coach or that sport, but then they'll transfer because they're like, hey, I did want to be a nurse. I can't do that here, you know, um, things like that. So that's really important. Um, cost uh, to attend, look at that, know what your family can afford. Um, and, you know, and try to make some decisions that way. Look at the soccer program. What do you want your college experience to be? on the soccer field and in the classroom and socially. Um, so, you know, it's a lot a lot of things that could go on. Unfortunately, we have lost the spring to go to some college spring games and possibly see the level of play. But it's always great to watch the team play as well and see if um, they play a style you like or a formation or, you know, how the coach interacts with the team, you know, things like that. So we have lost that. Um, but again, the college has also lost watching you. So it, you know, it, it goes both ways. What I always tell my student athletes that I, um, you know, advise is that sports, great, they're a huge part of your life, but you have to go pro in something. It's typically not going to be, you know, soccer. So at the end of the day, you got to find a school that fits your academic profile, which you discussed. And the way I position it is, God forbid you break your arm, your leg, or you have a falling out with a coach, you have to love that school. So always soccer has to be the secondary consideration, but at 16, 17, even 18 years old, you're like, I wanna play soccer, uh, you know, but I'm gonna go there and just do that. And that's your life. Unfortunately, it's a small part of your life. So always base it like, hey, you know what? If I can't play injury, what have you, you have to love that school. Fortunately, I love Bryant. A little too much. <laughs> a little too much. But we're here to, it, it's kept us together. Yep. So unfortunately yep. or fortunately, so. We've turned out well. <laughs> I'm, I'm the outlier. So, but anyways, so always consider that you got to love the school academically, financially, location, you know, um, and develop. And what I would suggest also is you don't have to do this in a vacuum. Um, you know, you can surround yourself with decision makers or uh, influencers or peers, uh, you know, that can help provide these decisions. Coaches, um, academic advisors, friends, family, you know, and I think that will help you also keep a open mind and a, and a open perspective of what's valuable and what is, you know, too narrow. And like you said, transferring is, not, is a pain in the butt. You know, it's, you know, academically it's a pain, financially it's a pain. I mean, credits don't transfer half the time, but you know, that's a whole different story. Yeah, and speak to, I mean, you know, most kids are playing on, on a soccer club and um, they have older siblings who have gone to college or through the process. So definitely talk to those parents who have been there, done that. Um, they can give great advice on, you know, what worked well, what didn't, you know, what they learned along the way. Um, one thing you will hear is that when June 15th comes and it ends time for calls is that the coach is gonna wanna speak to the the student athlete, um, so, not to the parents. So that's, it's always a good reminder. So we have about five minutes left. So I wanted to make sure that uh, we could talk about this forever, but uh, I know you have uh, also work to do. So we appreciate your time. 
Um, I know you can't speak for all Division I schools and athletic departments, but what is the NCA and the university system doing to ensure the safety of students and athletes so they can return to campus for potentially the fall season? Potentially. Yeah, that's, that's a real tough question. Um, right now, um, the NCA took the lead, as we saw with the canceling of March Madness. Um, in a lot of this before a lot of the states and you know and the government really did so um they've been at the forefront um but now we're seeing more of a, a sit back and um coaches associations are starting to you know make some decisions um right now it'll be each state so the colleges need to follow what their state um, regulations are but the majority it seems are intending to come back from the fall and what that is going to look like you know i'm not sure um every day as you said is different so i think you know we all want to come back um, but don't know exactly what that's looking like so we're, we're planning for every scenario and um you know hopefully by the beginning of july we have more clarity um on what that will will look like but um you know what we're hearing especially in the northeast is that we, we plan to go back um and we'll see we'll see what happens could be a hybrid um, but that's what every college is working on right now. That's pretty much the majority of what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, whatever decisions are made at your local <laughs> university or even high school, it's for your safety. So just keep that in mind. Yes, disappointing potentially, but it's for your safety because we're in an unprecedented time period. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left before we get kicked off of our, of our call. Um, you know, we covered a lot of other things um, in those questions. So I just kind of wanted some of your advice as a as a mom and as a as a uh, athletic senior athletic director. So what advice would you have for a student athlete regarding the recruiting process if you had uh, one minute or two minutes to give them advice? Yeah, I would say make it your own and do what's best for you and don't compare yourself to your classmates or teammates because everyone has different goals. Um, different abilities to pay, what they're looking for in experience, what they may accept as their role on a team or not on a team. Um, so just make make it about you and don't compare yourself to, to anybody. Great. That's good, good advice. Um, now for your peers sitting on the sidelines at ECNL games, what advice would you have for a family or parent also going through this process? Because this is nerve wracking for parents. They always feel, uh, you know, underprepared and you know overwhelmed. For parents, yeah, yeah, I, I just would say to you know help guide them and um, you know listen to what they want out of their experience and um, utilize other parents and, and talk with them. Utilize the coaches um, to try to get whatever you know feedback you can. Um, go see, take them to college games once we have it again to. You know, see the level. It's one thing to watch things on a computer, but it's another thing to see the speed and athleticism and the strength um, in person. Um, so just you know, be as educated as you can in the process, and, and use everyone you have to you know help answer your questions. What I would say to parents is, you have to be involved in the process, and and you know, and I understand that this is overwhelming. Um, so many of the parents that are considering you know, Bryant or other schools. It's it just maybe English is a second language, you know, what have you. It's just, it's important to get as much information um, as quickly as you can. Freshman year, even eighth grade, it's like, all right, what do I have to start looking at? Unfortunately, many parents get involved in this too late. You have parents that do it too early and are like, I need a full scholarship by sophomore year. And then you have other parents, second semester, senior year, like, what are we doing? Again, prepare early, you know, it is overwhelming. So, you know, take in parts of the NCA booklet or the rules and regulations as they come about. And it's just great to familiarize yourself with. And if you have questions, the NCA has 800 numbers that you can call. Um, I've never called them, but you know, you can ask them, you know, questions, you know? Yeah, and it has become, um, it seems like the colleges want to be recruited just as the kids want to be recruited. So it's kind of going both ways. Like they want to know that you're interested in them as well. 
Um, so, you know, definitely, you know, start emailing, you know, usually I say by spring of freshman year during that season, um, just to reach out and reach wide. I mean, you know, I mean, I wouldn't pigeonhole anything too early. If, if, you, if you don't have an idea of what level um, you, you know, should look at is just, you know, reach wide and, and see what happens. Very good. Well, I wanted to thank you again for your time. Our conversation today was with Beth Wandais. Senior Associate okay. Athletic Director at Bryant University. Conversation today was rules, regulations, and considerations for Division I college soccer recruiting in general and during this COVID unprecedented time period. So Beth, I appreciate your time. You've been an exceptional resource. Let's give some virtual hugs, get in here. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, uh, Thanks, you know, great seeing you. yeah, you too. Your family stay healthy and safe. Any questions, goalkeepers and field players, you can reach keeperstop.com. We're happy to answer any questions. Beth, thank you very, very much again for your time. Bye. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Bye.